it's a really a pleasure to introduce Eric. Eric Sahai, I don't think he needs a big introduction, but I, I still uh, would like to introduce him. He's a, a group leader and assistant research director at the Crick Institute in London. Uh, he is leading his uh, laboratory, which is focusing on tumor cell biology and, and, and mostly cancer metastasis invasions at Crick. Uh, before that, he started his career as a PhD uh, in the Richard Treisman land in London, and he was studying the, the small GTPases. And then for a postdoc, he moved to, uh, um, also in London in Chris Marshall's lab, and also in, uh, then con continued in um, uh, John Condilli's lab in New York where he discovered the intravital microscopy and since then he's using it. He contributed to, uh, I think every single paper of Eric will have a little bit of intravital uh, microscopy in, in, inside. So he's in, uh, in, in, he set up his lab in 2004, so quite some time ago. Uh, and then uh, in 2015 when Creek was open, they were one of the first labs to move in. Uh, so, as I said, they're working on um, uh, how the cancer cells invade the, the, the stromal compartment, how they spread to the distant, uh, distant organs and for metastasis, and, uh, and the more recently, I think he is also focusing on the responses of cancers to the different therapies. And besides intravital microscopy, he's using fascinating cell biology and also a lot of uh, uh, modeling tools, a lot of mathematics in the, in the last uh, couple of years. Um, so really, uh, uh, I, 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 I will not take more time. Eric, stage is yours. You can, you can share your slides with us. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that uh, very kind and generous introduction, Daniela, and thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to um, uh, present our work to you today. So I uh, hope that you can see my screen. Um, one thing about you know such generous introductions is they just always make me feel old it seems like i've been around forever but uh, anyway <laughs> um i won't dwell on that so what i'd really like to do in the next uh, sort of 25 minutes or so is tell you about some work that we've been doing using uh, imaging to sort of um understand intratumor heterogeneity and just you know uh, before i kind of get started with the data i'll give you a little bit of background about you know why we're interested in this problem and our sort of thinking about it so I think like many people and like the, the sort of topic of today, we're interested in, you know, problems around uh, metastasis and therapy failure, which are, after all, you know, the most lethal aspects of cancer. And whilst, you know, it's very clear that cancer is a disease that's been driven, you know, and initiated by you know, mutations that occur in the cancer cells, kind of shown in green in this cartoon here, its phenotype and in particular, its propensity to metastasize and how it responds to therapy is also influenced by its sort of you know, local environment, so what's termed a tumor microenvironment. Uh, and this consists of a range of different other cell types shown in various colors here, but also you know, things like uh, the uh, extracellular matrix fibers and blood vessels, which are you know, a source of uh, nutrients and also a route by which uh, toxic metabolites can be uh, transported you know, away from the tumor. And you know where I think you know imaging really has you know a, a very kind of crucial role to play in understanding you know the interplay of these different cell types is that it really gives us you know a spatial context. It tells us you know who's next to whom and who might be uh, interacting you know uh, with each other. And from the point of view of you know thinking about you know invasion into the surrounding tissue, which is after all you know the uh, first sort of step in the metastatic process. Uh, you know, invasion is, you know, movement in space over time. So if you can capture both position and time, which is, after all, what, you know, live imaging does, uh, then you get sort of very direct uh, measurements of, uh, you know, how you know, cancer cells might be moving in the surrounding tissue and also arriving at other sites. Um, this is not something I'm going to kind of concentrate on too much today. What I'm really going to focus on is how imaging can help us to understand you know, kind of differences between uh, cancer cells and how some of those differences might actually relate to uh, you know, the underlying biology of tumors and how they might respond to some targeted therapies. So this is, uh, you know, a, kind of, you know, a cartoon really emphasizing uh, both, you know, the metastatic process that we'll hear a lot more about uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, the uh, responses of tumors to therapy. Um, but the, you know, the thing I like about this, which is from a, a Ralph de Baran Dennis, review is that it makes a point that was kind of missing on the other previous slide and that is that you know not all the cancer cells are in an equivalent state 
And this is you know, a review that's focusing on metabolic state, which is something I will kind of talk about. But the point is that you know, actually, you know, if all these cells are not in the, the same state, they might not all behave the same way. And we really kind of need to understand you know, uh, which of these cells might be more or less dangerous or more or less likely to metastasize. And also, you know, what governs the transitions between these states? And you know, as a drawn here, you know, does a red cell always stay a red cell, or does it switch to being a white cell and, and, and backwards and forwards? And uh, I really think imaging has a great deal uh, to offer in terms of trying to understand these transitions because we can look at cells, uh, but because we don't have to destroy them when we look at them, we can then see what happens to those cells afterwards at you know various different time points. So this is just um, an example of you know, one of the sensors that really I'm going to focus on for the next uh, few uh, minutes. And this is uh, a metabolic sensor that tells you about the uh, kind of uh, levels of intracellular glucose in the cells, just uh, by way of a very brief introduction. It's based on a bacterial protein that binds to glucose. Uh, and when glucose is bound, you get a kind of conformational change occurring. And this basically means that two different fluorophores change their position relative to each other. And you can read this out you know, as a change in uh, both the uh, kind of uh, color of light coming off, but also the fluorescence lifetime. This is now what it looks like. And just uh, you know, for all the other uh, kind of slides that you'll see, uh, a red kind of color indicates a high level of energy transfer and a blue color indicates a low level of energy transfer. And a high color means high levels of intracellular glucose. So this is effectively a control experiment. If we have uh, no glucose present in the media, you know, every all the cells are the same sort of blue color. However, you know, even kind of you know in vitro, if we add glucose, and this is a very high level of glucose, sort of super physiological, but it's what's in you know all your standard DMEM media. Uh, you can see that some cells kind of go orangey red colors, but even here we can see intracellular heterogeneity with some cells, even in the presence of high glucose remaining rather blue. And this is just kind of plotted here and you'll see a few plots like this. So at the bottom, these cells have low intracellular glucose and these cells have high intracellular glucose. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is you know, in vitro, but you know, obviously one of the things that you know, we're kind of focusing on in this series is also intravital imaging. So this is now taking these cells, looking at them in the context of, you know, a tumor grown in the mammary fat pad of uh, mice, because this is a breast cancer model. And what I hope you can appreciate is that there is this kind of you know, single cell heterogeneity in the levels of intracellular glucose in those cells. So this is effectively a real data visualization of what I showed you on one of those introductory slides, uh, alluding to metabolic heterogeneity. Not only is there, you know, kind of pattern, you know, that sort of salt and pepper scale, if we kind of zoom out and now this is looking at the edge of one of these tumors, this is the collagen second harmonic imaging, indicating the kind of tumor stroma boundary. What I think is quite apparent in many of these tumors is that these kind of redder cells that have higher levels of intracellular glucose are more prominent around the edge of the tumor that you can see here. And this is just uh, zoomed in a little bit. So that's, you know, all well and good. We can, we can see a difference, but actually, you know, what does a difference in the intracellular, you know, glucose concentration of the cells actually mean? You know, there are a few different possibilities. One is that the glucose builds up because there's actually relatively low levels of glycolysis uh, happening. The other possibility is that actually, you know, there's high levels of intracellular glucose because you've got high levels of kind of flux through the pathway, meaning that there's high levels of glycolysis. And obviously to kind of, you know, really um, unpick those, we need to get a bit more orthogonal information. So in data that I, I won't go through today, we've kind of multiplexed some of the glucose sensors with other things telling us about reactive oxygen species or about mitochondrial potential. But the other kind of real, you know, I think important step uh, when Hiroshi Kondo was developing this project was he realized that actually you could flow sort the cells based on whether they had high levels of the fret signal or low levels of the fret signal. And this really opened up to us the world of doing, you know, kind of more conventional carbon-13 tracing and metabolomic analysis. So for those of you who are not so familiar with it, I will sort of, you know, cut to the chase and spare you, you know, uh, all the details of this. But basically what it enabled us to conclude with, you know, a high degree of confidence was that the cells that are kind of red that have that high kind of uh, intracellular glucose are actually more glycolytic. They have high glucose flux and they seem to be putting less of their um, glucose into the mitochondria, whereas those kind of, you know, low um, kind of bluish cells 
are doing a little bit less glycolysis, but they're using their mitochondria to a greater extent. So that kind of, you know, kind of confirms that there really is this metabolic heterogeneity that we can image. We can also then use the kind of you know, flow sorting to separate the two sorts of populations to then ask, okay, what else is different about them? Do they grow differently? Do they have different sensitivities to their local environmental context? And this is just sort of shown here. So if we grow them you know, kind of in media that's absolutely full of you know, all the goodies a cell could want, uh, then they grow equivalently. If we kind of uh, use what's called plasmat media, which is meant to be a little bit more like the in vivo kind of nutritional milieu, then actually you start to see that these high fret cells that are doing a bit more glycolysis actually grow a little bit slower. And actually we can get a really dramatic divergence in the growth properties of these cells if we take pyruvate out of the media, telling us that actually these um, kind of high intracellular glucose cells are much more de dependent on uh, extracellular pyruvate for their growth. Intriguingly, and I guess this you know, speaks to kind of crosstalk with the tumor microenvironment, it turns out that we can sort of rescue these cells uh, by um, actually co-culturing them with cancer-associated fibroblasts, a different cell type in the tumor microenvironment, suggesting that there might be some sort of uh, kind of, um, not quite symbiotic, but some sort of relationship by which, you know, metabolites from one cell are able to be utilized by a different cell. And we think that this might be required or linked to the requirement for you know, sufficient levels of NAD plus for biosynthesis. So, you know, with uh, you know, that in mind, we can then sort of you know, use imaging to do one of the things that I think it's, it's really great for, and that is to you know, look over you know, a period of time, because one of the questions that I sort of tried to pose at the beginning is, you know, are the cells that are in two different states, are they always in those sort of states irreversibly? Are those states heritable, or do they transition between them backwards and forwards? So what I hope you'll be able to see when I animate this uh, movie is, you know, actually uh, a, kind of a, a 10 hour time lapse of various uh, different cells. Um, and what is broadly apparent is that, you know, for these more epithelial looking cells, they stay, you know, in the same sort of color for the entire 10 hour period. However, these more sort of metastatic and aggressive MDA and B231 breast cancer cells are showing actually much more migratory behavior as you would expect, but they're also changing color much more frequently. And this is sort of uh, represented in a couple of different ways here. We can look at the correlation of what the biosensor signal was at time zero with what it is 10 hours later. So you get a beautiful correlation for these cells up here saying, telling you they're not switching very much. But for the 231 cells, it's much, much less. And for the MCF7 that I'm showing you most of the data with, it's a little bit you know, in between. So this tells us that some of these cells can transition between these states in a 10 hour period. Obviously, we have the ability to do you know, much longer movies, and this is now almost sort of 50 hours where you get a kind of couple of mitoses within there. And we can then ask, is the metabolic state of these cells you know, a heritable trait? So we can plot the first generation against the second generation. So this is mothers against daughters, or we can plot you know, the grandmothers against the granddaughters. And you can see you know, there's still a relatively good correlation through kind of you know, two cell cycles, although it does decay a little bit over time. And this is just to kind of uh, reiterate the point that actually you know, the doubling time of those cells when they're kind of uh, in the presence of each other, so the high and the low glucose cells, uh, is relatively uh, similar. Again, suggesting that they might be supporting each other in a way that they can't do when they're purified and cultured in the absence of pyruvate. So then, actually, you know, how long does it take for these cells to kind of you know um, you know transition back to the, the mean or the, or the population kind of average. So uh, to do this, instead of using cell tracking, you know, we actually return back to this flow sorting. So we sorted the high population and we sorted the low population and then just kind of measured them, you know, every day kind of afterwards to see what was happening. The low population stays low for, you know, uh, certainly four, five days, almost down to a week. Whereas the high population actually does over a period of about 48 hours transition back to you know being a little bit more like the kind of mixed starting population telling us that there's a you know perhaps a little bit of a you know a, a favorability for this high to low transition as opposed to the low to high transition so then this obviously poses the question about what might be driving the transition between you know these uh, two different uh, states that we're you know observing here and one thing that we kind of you know, noticed, and it's pretty obvious if you think about how this experiment is done, is that these cells kind of actually get a little bit more crowded and they kind of increase their confluence as time goes on. 
And this made us think that perhaps, you know, confluence might be driving this high to low transition. So just to, you know, um, kind of try to convince you that, you know, the crowding of the cells uh, is really you know, an important factor and actually to show you what I think is really quite a nice and, you know, uh, you know, dynamic uh, you know, bit of data. Uh, what we've done here is we've, we've really zoomed out. So this is kind of two, three millimeters across. You can barely make out the cells here, but you can see that they're relatively confluent. And when I kind of hit play, what you should see is a kind of, you know, a, a cross emerging here because we've done a scratch assay. And then you can just watch over a period of, I think it's about 48 hours that the clock is down here. What happens as those cells migrate into that space? And I think you get a really sort of you know striking view emerging that actually just around the edges you know here where the cells are moving into that free space you have these cells in this high glucose state whereas further back they're in that lower glucose state and if you kind of concentrate on this part of the movie here what I hope you can see is that when they come together again they return to that kind of low uh, lower glucose or lower intracellular glucose state so this really kind of tells us that you know the availability of space and the kind of coupled migration into that space is associated with that transition to the high state. And when the cells become crowded, they transition back into that lower state. And this is just zoomed in a little bit, you know, a still image to give you a further feel for that. So then, you know, this sort of correlation between the induction of this migratory state by having these cells with some free, free space to invade into um, and the upregulation of the glucose uptake you know, is it, it's a correlation, but we kind of quite like to understand, you know, is one thing dependent upon the other? So this is just actually interfering with, you know, uh, the induction of actin polymerization, because obviously actin drives this migration. And you can see that we get slightly reduced glucose uptake if we block actin polymerization, suggesting that there is some causal consequence between them. And, you know, this is, I think, you know, an area that uh, has been, you know, intriguing us and I think some others for, for many years, because obviously, you know, you know actin treadmilling, which is you know, at the, the very heart of, you know, actin dynamics, uses a lot of ATP because it hydrolyzes ATP to go through the process. And this kind of made us think that perhaps those cells that are migrating really, you know, most actively at the edges of those sort of assays might actually be, you know, undergoing greater energetic stress, you know, um, as a result of, you know, using all that ATP for actin treadmilling. And we could directly observe this actually if we now switched to different biosensors showing us that they seem to be a bit ATP depleted and are actually increasing the levels of activity of AMPK, which is a, you know, a sensor of energetic stress. So even though, you know, there seems to be some mechanism by which these cells can upregulate glucose uptake, they still, you know, over a period of, you know, 24 to 48 hours, those migrating cells do end up in some energetic stress. And we can make this even worse if we prevent them from taking up glucose. And actually this means that they migrate less well. So there seems to be some sort of coupling between actin dynamics, glucose uptake, which we are hypothesizing uh, might help those cells to meet the energetic demands of migration and then effective migration. In terms of you know what the sort of you know molecular you know mechanism of this might be, I'll just kind of you know, quickly touch on what we think might be happening. So this is now just plating cells with different confluence to ask you know what might be changing if the cells have lots of free space or not much free space. You can see that uh, the glucose uh, transporters, GLUT1 and GLUT4, seem to be slightly lower when the cells are highly packed, and this is associated with you know inactivation of you know the kind of actin treadmilling molecule cofilin as shown in this phospho plot here and it turns out that actually we think you know cofilin is an important uh, you know uh, mediator of you know actin turnover and that actin treadmilling is important for driving up the uh, you know glucose intracellular concentration as can be seen here where we've depleted cofilin so then just in the last sort of five or so minutes, I'd like to kind of, you know, give you a little bit of a flavor for how this, you know, intersects with other, you know, known regulatory mechanisms. So um, this is uh, obviously thinking about PR3 kinase, which is a well-known kind of uh, regulator of, um, you know, uh, intracellular uh, glucose and glycolysis. And what we can see here is that if we treat the cells with a PI3 kinase inhibitor, we get a reduction in, um, you know, the number of cells that have a high glucose state. But interestingly, you know, there are some cells that seem to persist in this kind of high glucose state, even in the face of the PI3 kinase inhibitor. And we know that every single cell is actually effectively being 
inhibited. And then actually we can do things that are kind of you know, single cell dose response curves and track you know, that these cells really are not responding, whereas within the same population, we can see stronger respondents. So we know kind of what's going on at the single cell level. So this tells us that you know, even within this sort of heterogeneous population, there might be different drivers uh, of pushing those cells into that high glucose state in uh, some cells versus others. So, you know, a PI3 kinase refractory population of cells exists and, you know, through, you know, uh, I guess, you know, reading the literature and, you know, a candidate approach, we identified, you know, another driver uh, that we think is in parallel, you know, driving some cells into that intracellular or into that high intracellular glucose state. Um, I should apologize. This is a horribly busy slide, but just concentrate on the boxes here. So this kind of tells you that if you have cells that are at low confluence, PI3 kinase, affects the intracellular glucose. If there are high confluence, uh, it doesn't really have much effect. And this is presumably because, you know, the PI3 kinase mechanism and the kind of actin mechanism are converging on the same regulatory input, potentially GLUT1 and GLUT4. However, if we uh, treat with an inhibitor of the bromo domain, what I hope you can appreciate here is that actually we can actually drive this down both in the low confluence and in the high confluence conditions, suggesting that there might be an epigenetic route that also regulates a subpopulation of those high intracellular glucose cells. So just to kind of you know uh, start you know wrapping things up a little bit, uh, we've now kind of returned back to the in vivo context, uh, which I hope you can appreciate here. This is another of these control tumors with the high intracellular glucose cells very much around the edge. If we treat the mice now with the PI3 kinase inhibitor, you can see that we have, you know, a reasonably effective, uh, you know, reduction in the kind of high uh, glucose cells, but it's not kind of complete. And we end up with a few cells in this kind of, you know, salt and pepper pattern here, um, kind of close to the edge. And this is actually, you know, surprisingly well replicated in our very simple in vitro scratch assay. And what I'd like to kind of propose based on some of the other data is that actually these kind of you know, persistent cells that remain in the face of the PI3 kinase inhibitor are in this high intracellular glucose state as a result of the activity of the bromo domain molecules. So, you know, just kind of, you know, bringing this uh, together into, you know, a uh, model, what, you know, I hope I've been able to kind of convince you is that there is this kind of, you know, heterogeneity in metabolic state that we can see in vitro with some cells being PI3 kinase dependent, you know, around the edge. And we think these are perhaps the more actively migrating cells, uh, you know, moving off into the free space or the kind of stromal rich space surrounding the, the tumor. But there are also these cells uh, that are kind of PI3 kinase independent. And probably what we want to do to have optimal tumor control is to kind of target both of these mechanisms. Through the use of imaging and other approaches, we can actually get some information on the kind of, you know, kinetic sort of, you know, dependence and the, the, the rate at which these transitions might occur. And hopefully I've been able to kind of convince you that actually, you know, migration depends, you know, um, upon, you know, uh, kind of actin treadmilling, as is obvious, but that is also linked to, you know, uh, you know, uh, inc or sort of addressing the energetic demands of cells that are very actively migrating. So just, uh, I guess, in the last uh, minute or so, I'll uh, tell you a, a quick whistle-stop tour of what we're kind of thinking of next. And this is, you know, not thinking so much about what's happening in the primary tumor, uh, but actually what's happening when these cells arrive at a secondary site. And this is just to kind of give you a, you know, a heads up of where I think we can take some of this technology and what might be interesting to kind of, you know, discuss uh, in, you know, the sort of, you know, future. And that is because these, you know, techniques are a single cell resolve, we can actually study, you know, micro metastases and these really kind of small, you know, metastatic deposits or even dormant metastatic cells uh, and get an insight into what their metabolic state might be. So just to give you a heads up of you know, the, the sort of problem that we're now thinking about applying these sensors to is, you know, these indolent kind of micro lesions that kind of persist for many years and months. And just to flag up that, you know, we can identify these cells, you know, in the, in the lungs of mice, they seem to be interacting very extensively with actually, you know, local epithelial cells within their environment. And I won't actually take you through uh, the details of this, but we do have some data that uh, you know, these cells have a very distinct metabolic state as is kind of, uh, alluded to here, but uh, for reasons of time, I will whiz through that uh, and just kind of tell you that 
uh, we're now trying to you know, uh, you know, understand you know, what might be uh, important in terms of this distinct metabolic state, thinking about things involving you know, lysosomal metabolism, but also fatty acid, acid metabolism. And there have been a number of papers recently about the role of fatty acid metabolism and uh, its uh, involvement in metastasis. So this will inevitably involve the design of new biosensors, which is hopefully something we might be able to do over the coming years. So I uh, won't uh, take you through this for reasons of time, uh, but I hope that uh, you know, in a few years time, we can kind of look at you know, these kind of micro lesions at uh, distant sites and really kind of gain insights into you know, their metabolic state and also you know, their vulnerability, because what we want to do is not just study these cells, we want to identify ways in which, in which we might be able to target them therapeutically and actually eliminate them. And we think it's important to understand you know, the metabolic state of these more indolent cells because it's likely to be very different from the more actively, actively growing cells that we observe in the primary tumours. So I will kind of finish there with some uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, I hope I've been able to kind of persuade you that imaging can give you know, unique insights into intercellular heterogeneity and transitions uh, between cell states. This uncovers, you know, very significant metabolic heterogeneity, even in very kind of, you know, simple models, you know, based in cell culture uh, of you know, cancer cell lines. And um, this you know, heterogeneity is probably, you know, a reflection of uh, both slight differences in epigenetic state, but also, you know, the very local context of the cells in terms of, you know, uh, you know how much space they have around them and maybe how actively uh, they are migrating. And uh, just, you know, as I try to highlight at the end, you know, the single cell resolution of these imaging methodologies should it kind of offer, you know, unique insights into, you know, cancer cells that are in transit between locations and indolent micrometastases. But that's uh, something for the future. And I uh, hope we can have some stimulating discussion later. So I will finish there by uh, thanking those who did the work. It was really led by uh, Hiroshi Kondo uh, with help from Colin Ratcliffe and kind of setting up and working on the dormancy system was done by Mark and Montagna with uh, great help from uh, Manuela Zangrossi um, back in Italy where Marco is now setting up his own independent position. So uh, thank you. Um, I will endeavor to answer questions either now or later. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so we have time for a couple of questions and I will start with the first question, which is from Sara El, El Safi. Uh, she's asking, is it possible that the cell contact affect metabolism? In other words, is it possible that the crowded cells exchange metabolites favoring low glucose metabolism? And related to this, maybe it's a question from Eloise Grassa. She's saying, very nice talk. You, should, you show that the cells in contact with empty space are in high glucose state. Do you know whether its state is influenced by cell-cell junctions? Does the loss of cell-cell junction can switch low glucose state into the high glucose state? Yeah, um, so they are all great questions. Um, in terms of the contact dependence, one thing that I kind of whizzed through for reasons of time, in those indolent cells, one of the things that seems to be important for uh, you know, their at least lysosomal metabolic state is the presence of efferin receptors. So these are kind of cell-cell contact mediated molecules. And we think actually in that context, there are signals communicated between the uh, lung alveolar epithelial cells and the breast cancer cells that have arrived there. But you get these contact mediated signals that influences the metabolic state of the breast cancer cells there. In the um, context of the kind of you know, the monocultures, as it were, so the cancer cells talking to each other. Uh, Hiroshi did do some experiments uh, where he depleted, um, I can't remember if it was alpha catenin or P120 catenin to in influence cell cell junctions. And there was clearly something interesting going on, but we struggled a little bit in terms of uncoupling direct versus indirect effects because so many things change with the cells in terms of their migratory dynamics when you. Um, you know, interfere with the cell-cell junction. So I'm sure there's something more of interest to discover there, but we didn't quite manage to get there yet. Thank you. Antonio, will you ask or I ask? Yes. I you can, can go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I can go ahead. So David Brand, he's asking, very nice talk. He's also saying, do you think that the cells might be making a self-directed gradient of glucose metabolism? When cells reach the free space, metab uh, metabolism might change because of the local gradient. 
and what it happens if you put cells in some kind of uh, chemotactic gradients within a kind of a metabolic or glucose gradients like in cell chambers? Yeah, so um, that's a, a great question, something we sort of toyed with doing but haven't done yet. So, you know, kind of, I mean, I don't think the cells would migrate up a glucose gradient, um, but I don't, you know, I don't know that for, for definite. But um, yeah, no, I think there's some really interesting stuff you could do about, you know, culturing cells in gradients of metabolites that might somehow reflect, you know, distance from the tumor edge or from a blood vessel or whatever, and then washing in, you know, inhibitors or other perturbations whilst maintaining this metabolite gradient. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a very fertile playground, but we haven't got there yet. <laughs> Actually, I have a question that joins a little bit with V9. It's about actually the tumor edge in vivo. It's, for me, it looks very sharp, the transition between high and very low. And do you think this is basically due to the interaction with the stroma, or is something going on there is different? So um, I'm sure the interaction with the stroma is, is doing some things, just you know, uh, a couple of control experiments that I didn't show you. So we did stain for blood vessels. It doesn't seem to be related to proximity to blood vessels. And as far as we could tell, those tumors, at least in those kind of areas that we were looking at, were relatively well oxygenated. So we don't think it relates to that. I guess my one kind of last comment about that is that we could recreate, you know, relatively or surprisingly sort of similar kind of edges and margins just doing those scratch assays mm -hmm. in culture where there's no stroma present. Um, so you can get similar patterns without having stroma there. It's my great pleasure to present uh, Jackie Goetz. He's a, he's, a, he's a group leader in the Inside Strasbourg, France. He did his PhD in, uh, between Strasbourg and Montreal in the lab to get, uh, in Kent to get his lab. Then he moved back to Madrid uh, with um, Miguel Andre de Pozo and back to Strasbourg again. And in the, all through this, uh, through, through this moment, he always was interested in bio biomechanical forces. That are implicated in metastasis growth and the remodeling of the microenvironment. He's been using mouse and zebrafish models, and in particular, he has shown some very interesting data in intravascular, intravascular trafficking of tumor metastasis and also the, the fate of tumor extracellular vesicles. I think today he's going to talk a little bit about tumor metastasis. It's a great pleasure to, um, to introduce you and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes, everything's good. And you can be on your own. I can. I can hear you. It's okay, Jackie. It's okay. Uh, so, well, thanks a lot, Antonio, for the introduction. So, I'm very happy to uh, also have the opportunity to present some of the work that we've been doing in the lab and that we are uh, currently doing in the lab, and we're mostly focusing on. Uh, on intravascular events uh, that occur and that are essential in driving uh, tumor metastasis. And, and the movie that you're looking at is uh, just an, an example of one of the models that we're using, which is the zebrafish embryo, allowing us to really probe uh, blood flow in, in addition to, uh, to looking at tumor cells that you see here in blue uh, in the context of, uh, of, tumor, of tumor metastasis. So before I, I move on, um, if I can, uh, this is just a quick slide, sorry, uh, to thank the people who are doing actually the work. Uh, I'll go back to them uh, at the end of the talk, but these are the people who are actually doing the work. I just want to emphasize that we have an open position for performing intravital uh, microscopy in the context of tumor metastasis that's, that is currently open. So the, the main focus of, uh, of my team is really to try to resolve uh, tumor metastasis from uh, many different uh, uh, point of views. And it's based mostly on, on, on a few facts. The first one is that the key, most of the key events of tumor metastasis are actually very rare. And, uh, and to, to our knowledge, they are most, for most of them, they are poorly, uh, poorly resolved. And this is why uh, we uh, spend a lot of time designing new uh, uh, imaging approaches that allows to uh, increase both temporal and, uh, and, and spatial resolution of the imaging that we're looking at. Uh, we need to take into account that there's a strong contribution of external cues. This can be biological, of course, coming from the tumor microenvironment, but also mechanical uh, through forces. And this is something we're really interested in. We also think and we reason that there's an unexplored diagnosis potential. 
uh, that could be used in terms of early detection of, uh, of the disease uh, that could potentially be probed using a liqu liquid biopsies. And this is one of the reasons that we're also interested in, in, in extracellular vesicles. Uh, in, um, and well, most importantly, in the property that they have to prime uh, uh, metastatic niches. And we're also working a little bit on, on developing new treatment strategies, but I won't go into the details of that uh, uh, today. And we're doing this, so uh, basically by, by designing new, and I, I will quickly go on that, uh, new imaging approaches that allow us to combine the power of intravital imaging with the power of uh, electron microscopy that uh, can uh, drastically increase the resolution of imaging. Uh, we also develop bio biophysical approaches that allow us to probe mechanical forces in vivo which uh, I will show it uh, to you are essential in, in shaping uh, tumor metastasis. And as I said, we also uh, spend a lot of uh, time uh, uh, in the past years in trying to understand how uh, tumor extracellular vesicles, which could potentially be used as, uh, uh, as a source of uh, new biomarkers, can actually prime uh, metastatic niches. And we, uh, we actually started uh, working on that all, also because we thought that uh, uh, microscopically speaking, uh, uh, there was a niche to explore and to, to uh, actually provide some new improvements in, in detecting them uh, in vivo. And we're trying to do that by combining actually two uh, in vivo models, the zebrafish embryo that, that, that we're using uh, very regularly, but also the mouse system, uh, and with some validation that we provide in, in, uh, in humans, with the overall idea of really trying to dissect all these intravascular steps that are essential in shaping uh, tumor metastasis. And the two movies I will show you now is, uh, is uh, just a summary of a uh, uh, highly collaborative work that we've done in, uh, uh, in the past and a technique that we're still using today. Uh, which was uh, developed uh, in collaboration with the, the group of Yannick Schwab and Frank Winkler, and, and thanks to uh, uh, Mattia Karaman, who is now in the lab of Frank Winkler, and with one of my first PhD students in trying to combine, as I, as I told you before, the, the, the power of intravital imaging uh, that in that case allows to probe single tumor cells, for, for example, in the context of, uh, of brain metastasis in the mouse, with uh, uh, the high resolution power of the electron microscopy that is here probed using uh, FIPSAN imaging that allows you to scan the exact same tumor cell that was probed uh, from an intravital imaging point of view uh, dynamically uh, uh, with the power uh, of this very high resolution uh, imaging that you can get uh, and in 3D. So this is 3D volume electron microscopy that you can get from the exact same tumor cells and then basically scan and see how this cell is, uh, is in that case sitting in, in, in this blood capillary uh, and, and trying to extend this tiny figure between two uh, 200 tumor cells. So this is something that we I spent a lot of time on and uh, maybe Mattia is in the audience today and she was very keen in developing this uh, and it's, it's actually it's a wonderful technique that gave us a, a lot of insight. Uh, and uh, so as I said at the beginning, I think we, we think that, um, sorry, I have trouble with the slides and you can see. I'll go slowly. Um, trying to develop and to increase massively the, the, the both spatial and temporal resolution because uh, to look at tumor metastasis, you uh, most of the time interested uh, if we talk about space from the uh, looking at it from the animal angle, but uh, uh, you want to also uh, at the same time be able to, 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 to move down to the resolution of, of, of molecules. It's some, some, not something that we're doing, but we're trying to span the entire uh, length of, of, of that uh, of that three, so that we can provide uh, uh, imaging at different stages uh, uh, in, in space uh, uh, at the same time, and at the same time increase the, the, the temporal resolution. Because for some of the of the events that we're interested in, uh, which might take uh, years in the context of metastasis formation, uh, sometimes happen in, in the in the context of, of seconds or milliseconds. So you need to to be able to develop imaging uh, uh, approaches that allows you to combine and to basically move from one model to another so that you can actually play with these different uh, uh, resolutions that are required to understand uh, the different steps. And as I said, this is something that we're doing by using, uh, sorry, by using a combination of different models, the zebrafish embryo and the mouse system, but also by combining different approaches and different experimental models. So one of them is to play with different microscopy approaches. Of course, uh, intravital microscopy combined with uh, electron microscopy is one way to, to drastically increase uh, uh, the, the, the spatial resolution of your imaging technique. But then by combining the models and by also uh, uh, tuning the disease monitoring system that you're using, uh, you can also uh, uh, basically ask and, and question the exact same events uh, from a diff different point of view, 
and improve the temporal resolution of, of the system. And I, I hope I will be able to show you a few examples uh, of how we do that in, in the team. So as I said at the beginning, we're mostly interested in, in these uh, intravascular steps uh, of tumor metastasis, which are essential and, and by focusing uh, mostly on the late stages uh, event, meaning uh, 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 when the tumor cells are able to seed uh, um, vascular regions that are prone to tumor metastasis formation. And I actually decided to give you a few snapshots of, uh, of uh, a few of the, the, the studies that we developed in the team uh, when we looked at many different stages. And I will start uh, uh, by the first one, which is how potentially, uh, how actually extracellular vesicles are capable of priming uh, metastatic niches at distance by, by, uh, by being shed away from the primary tumor uh, and, and basically probe and prime this microenvironment so that they, were, they are actually able to welcome uh, the arrival of the arrival of, of circulating tumor cells. And this is something that we uh, uh, actually started doing by uh, uh, developing a, a new model, which is actually to isolate in vitro uh, from, uh, uh, from cellular systems, extra cells that we were able to then uh, uh, fluorescently label using a, uh, using a lipid dye that was bright enough, which uh, 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 based on this very high quantum yield, to be able to be detected once this, uh, these extracellular vesicles are then intravascularly injected uh, uh, in the zebrafish embryo. And the first challenge for us was actually to be able to see uh, whether we could actually temporarily uh, resolve uh, uh, the, the, the way these extracellular vesicles are disseminating in, in the vasculature. And this is why we saw that the zebrafish embryo could be a, a fantastic system for doing that. So this is one example of this type of images that we were able to get by fluorescently labeled extracellular vesicles uh, with the lipid dye, and once they are injected, and here they appear in cyan uh, in the zebrafish embryo by focusing on the caudal plexus region, which is this caudal region here in the zebrafish embryo. And that allows us to combine uh, uh, fluorescent imaging from the EVs uh, in combination to imaging uh, coming from the, uh, the, the flowing erythrocytes in addition to the endothelial cells. And uh, by doing this, uh, we are also very lucky to see that uh, the, this high intensity that we were able from, uh, to obtain from the exhaustor vesicles is sufficient enough uh, so that we could uh, uh, resolve them uh, in, uh, uh, in time very, very accurately. So this is a very high speed acquisition for uh, a similar region in the caudal plexus of the zebrafish embryo, where we can see that actually we can, we can uh, uh, very nicely resolve individual extracellular vesicles that are being shed in these blocks in this, in this blood circulation. So it's, uh, being able to resolve this was, uh, was something that was very uh, uh, interesting to us and we, we decided to pursue on, on that particular aspect. And this is another set of movie where we started to characterize how these extracellular vesicles are actually are shed uh, uh, within the blood circulation, where we very quickly realized, uh, and you could see it from the previous movie as well, uh, that uh, uh, very rapidly the extracellular vesicles that we had injected in the, in, in, uh, in the zebrafish embryo were clustered in a specific regions, uh, which actually corresponded very nicely to patrolling macrophages that we could uh, uh, detect uh, using another transgenic line uh, uh, in that case. And this was key actually to, uh, uh, to try to understand and something that we would like to pursue now in the future and trying to understand how actually these uh, patrolling macrophages or monocytes can actually contribute to the priming of these, uh, of these uh, metast metastatic niches. Uh, and again, so this is something that uh, uh, is, uh, uh, was uh, uh, performed by, by increasing massively the temporal resolution of the imaging that allows us to very accurately scan and uh, uh, hemodynamically how these extracellular vesicles actually spread in, in, in the blood circulation. We then also combine this type of uh, imaging with uh, intravascular correlative microscopy because one of the key questions in, uh, uh, in the field is how extracellular vesicles actually, once they've been internalized by, uh, by recipient cells, how they can actually transmit the message that they are, they are actually carrying. And we decided to, to go back to this uh, intravascular correlative uh, uh, electron microscopy approaches that we, uh, that we performed in the past to try to, uh, uh, to, to narrow down the, the regions where the, uh, the extracellular vesicles are actually uh, being internalized and being, uh, uh, being taken uh, um, by tumor cells to, to basically know a bit more on how this, this, this message, is, message is being transferred to the, to the, to the, the cells that actually have taken them massively. And this is something that we're able to do by combining, again, the power of uh, intra, intravital imaging that allows us to uh, very uh, nicely scan in 3D the cells, and in particular here, two, uh, uh, two patrolling macrophages that uptake a huge amount of extracellular vesicles, 
but, but then to actually resolve the exact same uh, uh, macrophages by electron by the power of serial uh, transmission electron microscopy. And by doing so, we were actually able to show that most of the exhaustive residual that are being uptaken by these patrolling macrophages very quickly end up uh, in late endosomal or lysosomal compartments, uh, suggesting that they, uh, they are very quickly being, uh, uh, being delivered and, and, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to degradation. So this is something that, uh, that is uh, actually something we will pursue in the future. In addition, we also noticed that uh, uh, the, the, the way, of course, these exhaustive residuals are, are being shed in the blood circulation is highly dependent on, on, on the blood flow circulation. And we can probe actually very accurately the blood flow profiles in the zebrafish embryo again by using, by using high speed imaging, which when combined to, uh, uh, to PIV analysis, uh, uh, we can actually very accurately uh, dissect uh, uh, the hemodynamic profiles that are at play in very spe specific regions of, of, the, of the blood vasculature. Uh, and this allows us to actually uh, very nicely dissect uh, the different blood flow profiles that, that, that are uh, at play uh, in specific vascular regions, such as the dorsal outer of the zebrafish embryo, uh, which you can see here spanning this caudal uh, plexus region in the, of the zebrafish embryo, uh, where the flow then travels back into this caudal vein, uh, uh, um, flowing back into the heart for, from the, of the, the zebrafish embryo. And we actually, when you do this, uh, uh, this game of comparing uh, the blood flow profiles to the regions where uh, we see uh, most of the exterior vesicles here in blue uh, are being arrested, we can actually notice that there's a very good correlation between uh, blood, low blood flow, flow uh, profiles, such as uh, this venous compartment, which have very low uh, uh, flow velocities, which actually display a very high uh, amount of uh, uh, extracerebral arrest, uh, such as this region, for example, which sits in between the dorsal outer and the caudal vein, where we can see a, a, a huge amount of extracerebral, basically suggesting that uh, extra cervicals, once they are shed in the blood circulation, actually uh, are subjected to, to uh, blood flow uh, forces and permissive flow uh, profiles would actually favor the arrest of this specific extra uh, uh, in, in specific uh, in specific regions, which might actually uh, 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 induce and, and, and control the way they are being uptaken by these endothelial cells. So we can probe this at, at very high, uh, as I said, temporal resolution by, by doing high speed imaging of both uh, blood flow and extracervical uh, shedding in this blood circulation, which allows us to, to actually show that most of the extracervicals that we can detect in a single uh, blood vessels are able to span the entire section of the blood vessel that we're that we, uh, we looking at. And because of their low size and the, the high mar margination properties that these extracervicals have, uh, uh, but potentially also the adhesive cap capacities that they have, uh, this actually uh, might favor the way they actually interact uh, uh, very closely with endothelial cells and might dictate how they actually uh, end up being internalized and uh, in specific endothelial cells in the context of this metastatic niche uh, priming. So we think that it's actually a combination of, uh, of being subjected to flow forces, but also expressing adhesion molecules at the surface uh, of these extracervicals that actually uh, dictate how efficiently they stop uh, within specific blood vasculature uh, regions. And we actually studied this uh, a bit more recently in the context of, of, of another story where we focus on two uh, GTPases, RAL A and RAL B, uh, that Vincent and the team had, had uh, studied in the past. And we actually uh, started to work on these two GTPases mostly because we, uh, uh, Vincent realized that actually when we do deplete these two genes, this leads to a, a massive reduction in the number of extra vesicles that are being uh, uh, shed by, by, uh, by, uh, uh, by cells and in particular by uh, uh, mammary carcinoma cells. And this is a model that we've actually used uh, uh, recently in this, in this paper where we uh, focused on understanding and dissecting the, the molecular mechanism, uh, which, uh, is, which are at the basis of, of this reduction in numbers of extra cervicals and their ability to prime uh, uh, metastatic niches. So very quickly, uh, I'll go uh, in, in quickly around uh, uh, through, this, uh, through this study. Uh, it's actually very interesting to, to, uh, to notice that uh, the level of expression of both RALE and RALB uh, correlate with very poor prognosis in the context of breast cancer. And when Vincent started to work on that, he actually very quickly realized that when you deplete either RAL-A uh, or RAL-B in, uh, in 41 mammary carcinoma cells, this leads to a very strong reduction in the number of multivesicular body uh, uh, within, the, within the cell, which, which is actually the platform uh, of formation of these extracellular vesicles. 
This actually turns into, uh, uh, as I said, a, a strong reduction in the number of extra vesicles that are being shed by these, uh, by these cells when you knock down RALI or uh, uh, RALB. And what was also very interesting to notice is when we perform proteomic analysis of the extra vesicles that are being uh, uh, controlled by these different uh, cell population, we could actually uh, uh, narrow down to a few uh, proteins that are uh, differentially expressed depending on the conditions. Uh, and uh, by, uh, by looking more, more carefully into, the, into these results, we actually were, were very much interested uh, in a few of them, mostly because uh, they are actually expressed uh, at the surface of these extra cells. And one of them, uh, which is this addition molecule CD146, CD was very interesting to us. It's, it's expressed on the, on the surface of endothelial cells, for example, and it was strongly involved in, uh, in, in potential binding of extra cells uh, uh, in the context of priming of metastatic nature's. So we uh, uh, decided to, to validate this uh, uh, differential enrichment of this, uh, of this molecule uh, in the, the extra vesicles coming from this, this different population. And we could confirm that CD146, but all the two other proteins were uh, 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 decreased uh, uh, in, in amounts in, in these extra vesicles. And we went back to intravital imaging in the zebrafish embryo. By then, trying to control uh, uh, and to actually uh, inhibit the binding of CD146 uh, 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 coming from the extracellular vesicles to endothelial cells by using an, uh, an, an antibody directed against this protein. And when you use this, when you use this, this antibody, actually you can, uh, uh, you can uh, inhibit the binding of these extracellular vesicles to endothelial cells when you use the zebrafish embryo system. We can also strongly reduce the seeding of these extracellular vesicles in the lung uh, uh, in the context of a, of a mouse uh, uh, um, um, experiment. And uh, when we uh, uh, use this, this, uh, this antibody in the context of a, a priming uh, experiment, which allows to probe the, uh, the potential that extra vesicles have uh, to prime uh, lung metastasis in this experimental metastasis assay, you can see that extra vesicles, uh, when they are uh, coming from uh, the, the control uh, uh, 41 cell population, they can prime massively uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, lung metastasis that, 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 that this, uh, this tumor cell can form. But when we uh, uh, subjected these mice using an anti-CD146 treatment, we could actually reduce uh, uh, quite significantly the number of metastases that are, are, are being uh, formed upon uh, depriming of this extracellular uh, vasculature, uh, vesicle, sorry. Uh, so all together, this uh, shows that uh, RAL-A and RAL-B can control both the number of uh, uh, extracellular vesicles that are being shed by, by tumors, but also the adhesion the adhesome uh, uh, expression at the surface of the, uh, of the extra vesicles, which uh, both together act to favor uh, the priming of metastatic niches and then metastatic outgrowth. I'll switch now to, uh, to uh, uh, another uh, uh, context where we're using intraoretal imaging, which is uh, trying to focus on how actually blood flow forces are uh, um, actually tuning the ability that the circulating tumor cells have to arrest, stop, and then favor uh, metastatic outgrowth. And it's something that we did, uh, and I will go very quickly into that because this has been published a few years back, uh, where we actually were able to tune blood flow forces in the zebrafish embryo. So either tune and, 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 and try to come up with position of where the tumor cells would arrest in specific vascular regions, but also measure the hemodynamic forces in this particular region to actually come up uh, uh, with this very uh, uh, interesting model uh, showing that blood flow forces are actually capable of controlling the position of the of arrest of circulating tumor cells but also how uh, and where they would actually uh, extravasate. This uh, was then later being confirmed uh, uh, in a collaboration with Marcus Gladstall and, and, and Klaus Pantel, which actually were doing the exact same, uh, uh, the exact same thing, but looking this time at, at, uh, uh, at patients that had brain metastasis. And by combining uh, 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 a, a mapping of the position of metastasis in a cohort of 100 patients, they could actually uh, uh, result in the same, uh, in, in the same uh, 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 result that we obtained in the zipperfish embryo, which is that actually the position of the metastatic foci actually correlates very strongly with the blood perfusion that was happening in, 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 this, in, in this brain. We're also interested uh, uh, um, um, a bit more into how uh, the arrest uh, 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 can actually be induced by, uh, by the viscoelastic properties of the tumor cells in, uh, in this particular context. And again, this, this study by, uh, by looking at, uh, at some of the electron microscopy images uh, uh, from Mattia Karaman when we perform these in, intravitreal quality microscopy uh, uh, approaches where we can see that uh, the tumor cells 
in the context of brain metastasis in the mouse when they stop arrest and extravasate in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the brain parenchyma, they are under undergo massive deformation uh, in, in that context. And this is actually uh, something that we're probing right now by using uh, uh, beads, which act as a, as a force sensor uh, that we're applying to, uh, to the zebrafish embryo to try to uh, pinpoint and, and, and actually uh, unravel what are the forces that these particular uh, objects are, are subjected to when they stop in these specific vascular regions. And we're also trying to control uh, the viscoelastic properties of the different tumor cells and see how by tuning the viscoelastic properties of this tumor cell, we can actually uh, shape and affect tumor metastasis. We're also interested, and this is something I will uh, focus on uh, a bit more right now, at the contribution of blood components in, uh, 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 in the context of, of tumor metastasis. And we, uh, a few years back, started to look at the contribution of tumor platelets, of uh, blood platelets, sorry, uh, in the way they actually uh, contribute to, uh, to metastasis formation. And we asked two major questions. Um, does platelet binding actually uh, shape metastasis? And, and the literature seems to suggest that this is the case. But we thought that's actually, uh, that there is something that is still not very clear in the field is at which stage they actually do uh, favor uh, metastasis. So uh, we decided to look at that. And this is the work of Maria in the lab by basically starting to look at uh, first the level of binding of platelets to, uh, to tumor cells. And we very quickly realized that tumor cells do not bind platelets with uh, uh, the, the same efficiency. And we decided to focus on the 41 model, again, triple negative breast cancer, in comparison to the B16 uh, melanoma model, because they actually uh, uh, displayed very different uh, platelet binding efficiencies, as you can see from the scanning electron microscopy uh, uh, images. So what Maria has done very quickly is to use a, a thrombocytopenia model, which is based on the uh, uh, injection of an antibody uh, directed against GP1B, uh, which leads to a massive thrombocytopenia, as you can see here from the, from the platelet count. And then we used, in that case, not intravital imaging, but probing uh, using bioluminescence at the efficiency of seeding and metastatic outgrowth uh, uh, in, in, uh, in living animals. And what she, she saw actually is that thrombocytopenia in this model, which uh, where tumor cells actually bind uh, massively to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to tumor cells. Uh, this thrombocytopenia favors the clearance by increasing the intravascular gas and, 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 uh, and decreasing uh, uh, the arrest of the security tumor cells in the lungs by looking, again, using bioluminescence at, at timings that are very short uh, upon, uh, upon the ejection of the, of the tumor cells. When you do the exact same thing with, uh, 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 with the B16 model, which is a low uh, binding uh, profile uh, in, in, in our hands, Actually, thrombocytopenia has no, uh, has no effect. She then uh, uh, used uh, this exact same approach, but this time by trying to probe at how this would actually uh, uh, um, tune metastatic overflow, but, look, but by looking at linear, later time points. And again, uh, thrombocytopenia, one single shot of the antibody leads to, uh, uh, to a very strong reduction in the number of platelets. And this leads to a, a massive reduction in the metastatic outgrowth in the 41 model. Uh, but also uh, in uh, the, the, the B16 model, where you, she could see a very significant decrease that happens at later stages of, uh, 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 of this uh, metastatic outgrowth model, suggesting that there's a late contribution of the tumor platelets in, in this particular context. She then designed experiments uh, where we, we reasoned that we, could, uh, we should actually try to reduce the number of platelets uh, uh, for a longer uh, period of time to see whether we could actually detect this late contribution of tumor platelets. So when you do that by, by, by using three uh, uh, different shots of this uh, RAM6 antibody, anti-GP1B anti uh, antibody, leads to a very, uh, very stable reduction in, um, in terms of platelet count. There was no major effect on the metastatic outgrow uh, on, or basically how, on how thrombocytopenia uh, tunes the metastatic outgrow uh, in the 41 model. But then uh, when we looked at the B16 model, we could actually that there was a very strong uh, a further re reduction in, uh, in this effect in terms of metastatic outgrow suggesting and validating that there is potentially a contribution of, of tumor platelets to uh, 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 at later stages of metastasis, uh, of metastasis outgrowth. And um, what she did then uh, in, in another experiment is trying to probe whether by, by uh, inducing thrombocytopenia once uh, uh, met, uh, tumor cells have already established metastasis, so which means after the injection of the circulating tumor cells, and after the timing where she could actually see that the cells are capable of establishing uh, metastatic fossa, uh, whether this could actually also uh, impact metastatic outgrowth. And this is actually the case. 
when she injected the RAM6 antibody three days, seven days, and 40, 15 days post injection of the, of the tumor cells, she could actually uh, sh uh, show that there is uh, a reduction uh, in uh, the metastasis or go in the context of the B16 uh, uh, model, but actually not on the number of the metastatic uh, uh, foci, but rather on the size of the metastatic uh, foci, suggesting that there's uh, very likely a microenvironment and environmental contribution to the way these actually metastatic foci are uh, uh, actually uh, growing. So I think I will stop here at this stage, uh, just to summarize uh, 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 here again, uh, uh, on that scheme to show how uh, we are actually using intraoretal magic to probe a few of these intravascular steps uh, uh, and how actually this is important to, uh, to understand, to increase a bit uh, our understanding in that particular context. I skip this slide, I'll go back again to the, uh, to the people who are doing the job. So uh, the, the extracellular vesicle work is mostly uh, uh, coming from Vincent and all the teams working with him. Uh, the forces aspect is mostly the work of Nael and Gauthier with help of, of Sebastian and more recently from uh, Valentin and other people are also contributing to uh, most of the aspects. So the patent work is actually the work of Maria, a postdoc in, uh, a postdoc in the lab. And I'll stop here by thanking a few of the collaborators. <coughs> Yannick Schwab, with whom we developed the intraoretral quality microscopy approach. Frank Winkler uh, and Matja Kalman, with whom we developed that in the context of, of brain metastasis in the mouse. And a few of the other people that actually, I think I have listed uh, along, the, along the talk. And I thank you for your, for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you Jackie for uh, some really interesting results. I think we have one question from Anouk Zomer. It's about, uh, did you look at the macrophages because it, she saw and I, we also saw that, that there is some that capture a lot of extracellular vesicles and some that do not. Did you characterize this type of macrophages by facts for instance? Well, it's something that's really interesting at this stage, and this is the project of, uh, of Nandini uh, in, in the lab with Vincent to, to try to uh, look a bit more carefully at, at what is the potentially the effect. Uh, we are not sure that there's a major difference uh, of the, in, in the amount that, of the extra reserve that that's being uptaken by patrolling macrophages. What she might refer to is the fact that we could also see extravascular macrophages in the context of the zebra fish embryo that do not uptake extra vesicles at all. Mm -hmm. But the intravascular patrolling macrophages, they do uptake massively these, uh, these extracellular vesicles. Yeah. I have one yeah. question. Yeah. Go, on, go ahead, Daniela. So I can ask my own questions because there are no more on the, on the, on the Q&A. Um, so actually two questions. Uh, the first one, so some years back, uh, you know probably that, uh, we, so we showed that in the, in the liver, in the capillaries, the endothelial cells would express some fibronectin patches and that the circulating tumor cells would attached to them using the integrins. So my question is, do you see that on EVs, do they have integrins? And do you think that maybe they will be also attaching to some kind of extracellular matrix at the luminal sides on the endothelial cells? Well, we actually have uh, two levels of results on, on that aspect. One of them is that we've shown that uh, the position of extracellular matrix fibers is actually occurring. Uh, uh, and we can detect that, in, for, the, for example, in the zebra fish embryo. Uh, and it actually can be tuned uh, by blood flow forces. So this is one level of, of results. And the second is, yeah, definitely uh, integrin are, uh, are definitely expressed at the surface of the extracellular vesicles. So the team of David Leiden had published a few years back in Nature that depending on the integrin dimers that you have expressed at the surface of these extracellular vesicles, you can actually shape the organotropism of these extracellular vesicles and of, of tumor metastasis. And we see, of course, some of the integrins uh, uh, impacted in, in, in our studies as, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what about the, the platelets? I, 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 was, I was wondering if you incubate tumor uh, metastatic cells or tumor cells with platelets, do you get an increased rolling or attachment into blood vessels? Is this so, the way it works? Actually, the main result that we have uh, uh, coming from Maria's work is that she, she co incubates uh, platelets with tumor cells and then inject, the, the, inject this mixture in the zebra fish embryo, which is in our hands. Uh, uh, the model that we are using to probe very accurately how tumor cells behave uh, intravascularly and what she can see. So the rolling is not something that we've seen very often in, in the context of, of tumor metastasis, but we see increased arrests definitely when cells are co-incubated with, with platelets. So definitely platelets shape the way tumor cells, tumor cells actually arrest in specific vascular region. That's, that's for sure. Do you think this is something to do with damage? Because platelets are very attracted to endothelial damage or something linked to that? Well, at this point, it's not clear exactly how this is uh, happening. So one uh, aspect that we're interested in is the occlusion that might happen 
in, in that particular context mm -hmm. we've not looked at level of activation of the endothelial cells in, uh, in, in mm -hmm. that case. So it's my pleasure now actually to, um, to welcome Paul Timson. In, Paul Timson is a group leader at the Garvin Institute in, in Sydney, Australia. He has done his PhD uh, in the Piazza Institute for Cancer Research in UK with a migrant frame and then moved back and forth from, from, to Garvin and Piazza and, until he established his group uh, at the Garvin Institute. He's, he has made uh, significant contributions to uh, the understanding of tumor invasion and metastasis, focusing on the, the fa family of a raw GFTPases and also interested in the architecture, architecture of the tumor environment and resistance to therapy, in particular the implication of cancer-associated fibroblasts. I think he will talk, tell, you, tell you a little bit about this, his work and in particular the tools that he has developed for intervital imaging of, of this uh, role GTPAs. Uh, Paul, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And yes, Paul, guys, speak English. Speak English. Yes, <laughs> yes apologize for the English. <laughs> yeah, it's an important thing to say. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, okay, so that was great to talk after Eric and Jackie. Uh, Jackie is a real honor. I think they've covered most of the aspects that I will talk about today. So today I'll give you a kind of overview on intravital imaging that we do in our group, in particular pancreatic cancer, looking at the stroma, which we've talked about, looking at blood vasculature, and in particular looking at uh, FRET biosensors, which again, Eric had introduced already, which is easy for me to actually move on quite quickly. So obviously pancreatic cancer is um, a deadly disease which, in which many patients actually cannot even be given surgery. So they're highly metastatic, highly invasive, and so we actually have to come up with new ways to actually attack this disease, not just given um, chemotherapy on its own. We have to actually look at the primary site and the secondary site in many um, of the cases of pancreatic cancer. This is a major problem. So in a nutshell, we create and we've used a number of biosensor mice, which are pictured here, which I guess you could almost say our attempts are to increase this until we get all the hallmarks of cancer, which unfortunately keeps changing every year. So we try our best to keep up. Um, but essentially we make biosensors, FRET-based biosensors or ecotherm-based bio or FRAP-based biosensors where we can look at things like ecotherm, RORAC, GTPases, as um, Eric has already talked about previously. Um, SARC biosensor mice, AKT, CDK1 mice we've actually made now where we can actually look at geminobraxane or chemotherapy responses. And we can also look at things like hypoxia you can actually watch hypoxia move within the tumour. So I've highlighted here in red the pancreas, but obviously these are lock, stop locks, inducible mice. So you can actually take these mice and use them for whatever you want. And we pass them out to anyone that asks. Um, again, we use them for pancreas, but we've used them for intestine, liver, skin, breast, even the immune system, as that's becoming a hot topic, obviously, um, and also in the bone. So if you want to use them, feel free to actually ask and we'll pass them along. Okay, so I'll give you a few stories on how these are used, what's the benefits and um, basically what are the caveats and what should we actually learn from intravital imaging that we can't learn, for example, from two dimensions. So again, um, this is a few movies within the pancreas and if I maybe show you the my arrow here, you can see, for example, pancreatic tumour here in green. Um, you can see SHG and collagen surrounding this tumour, so that's densely packed, as we expect, in the pancreas, highly fibrotic. Uh, we can see blood vessels here in quantum dots to actually see that there's some um, very nicely um, vascularised regions, but obviously also other regions which are poorly vascularised and the flow is reduced, for example, in line with what Jackie was just talking about. So again, the extracellular matrix is a hallmark and a fibrosis is a real problem in this disease. But the idea of targeting this and stopping um, or alleviating the idea that fibrosis reduces drug delivery um, seems a simple idea, but if we reduce this too much, there's a real problem. And you can imagine that the fibrosis itself or the extracellular matrix, again, by SHG imaging here, can act as a kind of super highway for the cells to actually migrate and move on. So there's a kind of fine balance between um, how much is too much and how much is just not enough. 
And again, the idea is the extracellular matrix is not simply a barrier, it can also affect the tumour uh, calf kind of feedback from the extracellular matrix to actually tell the tumour that it can actually grow. And this is something that we actually want to alleviate or reduce. So simply, um, without going into any details, here's kind of a few movies of different projects we work on. For example, we can look at ecodherin within live tumours. And again, you can see here we can have um, chymographs where we can actually watch individual junctions break down over time. And again, in this project, I just wanted to show this one image where if we were in 2D, we don't actually see any differences when mutant P53 is overexpressed in the pancreas. Um, as that gain of function, and we know that that actually causes metastasis. Whereas when we go into three dimensions and in a live tumor setting, now we can actually see the dissolving of EKT and cell cell junctions that precedes that um, inevitable movement. So this kind of suggests to me that we need to have models where we can look both in 2D and 3D, but also we need to go into the higher fidelity models such as intravital imaging that allows us to actually look at that kind of molecular level. And again, James's project down here where we're looking at AKT, and I think this aligns quite nicely with Eric's talk on threat biosensors and metabolism. Again, when we do PI3 kinase in a two-dimensional dish, this is beautiful pictures down here in blue and red, where we can see that we can actually inactivate um, AKT. However, when we actually look in vivo, we have patches, just like Eric says, where we can actually see areas where AKT does and does not switch off. Um, and we think that's partly to do with hypoxia and partly to do with that natural heterogeneity that you actually see in a live tumour. So again, we have to go into the higher fidelity model if we actually want to understand the disease in its natural or native context. Okay, so this is a recent review, or not a recent review, it's two years old, but um, this gives a very simple overview of what we think there are out there, there are so many biosensors um, and it's very easy to get into intravital imaging if you just actually look at it from this simple perspective. There's lots of biosensors you can start in tissue culture with, move to 3D and then move all the way up to um, uh, xenograft work and then into the genetically engineered models. So for example, from initiating mutations um, in various key signaling pathways to, for example, metabolites, as Eric has talked about, to various signal transduction pathways, hypoxia, autophagy. We even have biosensors, as I say, and I'll talk to that a little bit, where we can actually look at the effectiveness of various chemotherapies. So we can actually see when the chemotherapy is working, when it's not working, and how best to improve it. And we've also got lots of different biosensors for the cell cycle, for example, and things like Roll, RAC, SARC, FAC, classic um, molecules involved in metastasis and the spread of the disease which this session is kind of focused on. Okay, so there's lots of biosensors out there. We work in pancreatic cancer, which is a terrible disease. And essentially by adding a Braxane to gym cytopene, which has been around for quite some time, we've got a very modest improvement in this disease. So we think it's a low lying fruit and we want to actually improve this disease. So one idea is not to just target the tumors, but also target this microenvironment and target this highly metastatic disease. So as an example, there's been previous work where we've actually seen that if you completely ablate the stroma, it doesn't work. Um, and in this paper, and this kind of idea of using intravital imaging, we could see when best to reduce the extracellular matrix or normalize those that calf um, or extracellular matrix tumor interaction to actually relieve that kind of fibrotic response in the tumors, open up those blood vessels, change the interstitial fluid pressure, improve drug delivery. And so that's kind of where we used intravital imaging to actually allow us to look at this in a fine tuned manner um, and watch it in a much more controlled manner, both in time and space. So as I say, the extracellular matrix of this fibrosis can allow attachment, it can allow act as a barrier, but it can also provide a highway. So we have to be very careful how we play with this and any given tumour, regardless of pancreatic or breast, etc. Okay, so we think it could potentially be an Achilles heel. Um, and one of the simplest experiments that we did was to just say, okay, let's look at how the extracellular matrix interacts with the tumour. So if we look at the kind of master regulator pathway of kind of raw and rock, we can see that there's a kind of feedback between the tumour stiffness to actually allow the cells to proliferate, but also allow the cells um, key motility and actinomyosin and cytoskeletal interactions. But at the same time in pancreatic cancer, there's lots of fibrosis, so this could be a vicious cycle. So the simple question Claire asked was, and I think Claire's talking in one of the next sessions, um, is to actually knock out 
rock in this pathway. So we used a really almost dirty drug that targets rock, both rock one and two, to ask the question if we could actually just normalize or stop this crosstalk and what happens here. So one of the simple assays we use is using um, calves from the KPC model, for example, and put them into organotypic assays. They can track over 12 days and we can either knock out genes or give various drug treatments. So as other people have seen, um, we can use second harmonic imaging both in vivo, but also in these three-dimensional assays. We can also look at cross-linking mathematically, and we can also look at the stiffness, which we've also talked about, which can actually be a positive reinforcer of how the cells move, but also how they grow and behave. Okay, so once we've got those little plugs, we can actually put them on an air liquid interface, and we can actually take cells from the pancreas put them on the top of these matrices and do rapid assays where we actually see them invading. And this is a really easy assay, but also helps us to understand how this tumour itself eventually does arrive in the liver mets. And again, we can even take liver mets and put them on here. So we've got lots of little tricks in the lab to actually be able to rapidly assess um, how to manipulate the extracellular matrix or the microenvironment and stop this metastasis before we actually go into the in vivo. So again, I'm trying to get across that intravital imaging is available for everyone. You just have to start um, at the early stages and actually start working your way up. So a simple experiment again is this Facidol drug, which targets rock. We can see the contractions are very ready, readily seen here, whereas we don't see such contractions here. We can do second harmonic imaging in these. And again, you can see that we don't lose bulk amounts of collagen. We just lose bulk amounts of the cross-linked SHG fibrillar collagen. So again, a small um, targeting of the extracellular matrix can make a big difference on the actual physical structure of those matrices. So we made small movies in these um, plugs either at six days, which is halfway through the process, or 12 days as the process ends. And so here you can see fibroblasts interact with the matrix and over 12 days this controls um, the extracellular matrix and has a beautiful mesh and cross-linking, whereas in the Facidol treated, you can see that these cells still do cross-link and interact with the extracellular matrix, but not in a free way. They're almost trapped. And eventually you can see a small kind of normalization or a calming down of those uh, calves and how they behave in this setting such that you don't have so much fibrosis. So it's a small, very easier way to actually look um, before you go into an in vivo setting to say, can we actually manipulate the matrix? So again, we do AFM and we can see that this is less stiff. We can do scan electron microscopy to confirm that the integrity is affected. The cross-linking or mathematical modeling is also affected. And again, like with Tom Cox, we can actually look at the birefringence and look at the early um, mature fibers and see what kind of ratios we get. So we can actually look at the kind of fine tuning of the matrix rather than complete ablation and ask the question, does this actually affect how chemotherapy or any other drug in this disease would actually penetrate or affect those tumour responses. And so that's exactly what we did with this knowledge. We then went on to these plugs. And as I said, we can put cancer cells on top. So again, we did a simple experiment. We give the Facidil to affect integrity. We wash this out and then we put cancer cells on and ask if they invade. We also do another experiment where we put it on only at the late stage, so nothing during this stage. And finally, we do an experiment where we have it on continuously. And the simple outcome of this was that we can see that here you can see pancreatic cancer cells invading the control setting. Early treatment, again, affecting all the extracellular matrix effects that I just showed you. We wash this out. So these cancer cells never ever see Facidil. They, they now can't invade. So they really need to engage in that integrin, um, possibly high dense stuff matrix to actually move. If we put it on late, it's too late. The matrix is already formed. And if we put it on um, in a chronic manner, it's no better. And you can quantify this here as the kind of early treatment or the priming scenario. So that's a really simple experiment. So we now call this priming. So this time we now do priming with Facidil or the rock inhibitor. And we then give the standard of care chemotherapy. And we ask the simple question, does this affect the proliferation of the cells? Does this affect the survival of the cells? So here you can see, as expected, chemotherapy reduces proliferation, increases the death. Facidil in orange does nothing. Um, in blue, we can see a significant improvement. So just this is one single time point that we can see that a simple 
targeting of the extracellular matrix before chemotherapy can actually enhance the response. So we wanted to look at this in a more dynamic way in an vital setting. So we went and looked for a biosensor that could potentially weed out the germ of vaccine arm. And essentially what we used was a CK1 biosensor mouse. Um, uh, this biosensor, which can respond to the abraxane arm, I guess, of Gemini abraxane, where we see an accumulation in the G2M. So the images below you can see in yellow, it's inactive, just like Eric was shown. Um, and here we can see FRET um, when CDK1 is activated with abraxane. And we've just, for proof of principle, put a, a CDK1 inhibitor in just to show the on off switch. So we then take this to the in vivo setting. Sorry. Um, I'll continue now. To the in vivo setting. Um, and we can readily see that what we learned in those 3D organotypic matrices actually held true in the mouse. So in the mouse, what we do is we have a fully blown tumour, we give facidil priming, we wait, we give geminobraxane, we wait, and then we do intravital imaging. And again, you can see geminobraxane does in fact work um, on its own. Priming with facidil does nothing to the cells. However, the double hit actually significantly improves geminobraxane. And I should note that this is just one uh, dose of this so we actually can cycle this and actually obviously this can all accumulate and actually result in a larger effect in the mouse. So obviously pancreatic cancer goes to the liver so we can also see what rock does there and again you can see large micrometastasis here and low um, micrometastasis in the rock treated scenario and again you can see second harmonic image in the liver so we can see that it significantly reduces the kind of global effects in the mouse um, rather than just simply looking at the primary tumour, which you would expect. So again, those are not just green cells, those have biosensors in them. So we can also quantify the reduction in the metastasis. But again, we can see that any of those METs that do form have actually got much more of a kind of arrest or response to that chemotherapy. And again, I should stress that this is just a one cycle of 10 days. So we can then treat those on a cyclical basis and it actually overall results in a much more reduced kind of metastasis and a much more um, effective response um, using such a very simple technique to actually target the matrix. So ROC 1 and 2 also play a role in uh, the vasculature and relaxation of the vasculature. So using quantum dots, we can see here in red, and you can see actually quantum dots kind of leaking out here. And if we have the control setting, we have a beautiful vasculature here, which is all kind of intact. Whereas in the facidil treated, we have a more relaxed or improved drug delivery, where we think that there's actually a much more relaxed um, response. Now, if you're priming, given chemotherapy, having a rest and then priming, you'll have a normalization effect. If you have this chronically, it doesn't work and it doesn't improve the chemo. So it's all about the timing. And again, this comes back to intravital imaging, where if you did this chronically, it doesn't work. Um, whereas if you actually pulse this and optimize this, you can actually get an improved um, response to the chemotherapy with less drug. And again, in pancreatic cancer, less is more in terms of those kind of very toxic drugs. So at the Garvin here in Australia, we have a large cohort of um, APGI based cohort of pancreatic patient samples, which is part of the ICGC. So we can actually have all the sequencing data, but we also have TMAs where we can actually look at the second harmonic imaging and we can pick out patients that are high, medium or low, for example. And again, you can imagine then you would imagine this regime would work for those that are more um, fibrotic versus those that are less fibrotic. And so long story short, that's exactly what we did. We went through each individual core in an automated way created Z stacks, SHG, uh, maximum project projections, and then picked out those that were high versus low. And for the, in um, for the interesting time, I'll just show you the high. Um, and so here's an example where, again, we've got a fully blown tumor now in the pancreas, primed geminobraxane, arrest, geminobraxane, arrest, and then we just cycle this. So here you can see the control, and you can see a rapid production of ascites and metastasis and full blown tumor. Gem reduces this. But Facidel and Gem has a significant effect, and you can actually see this over here on the survival. So in the green, you've got Gem cytobine. Facidel again doesn't do much on its own, um, and again, this chemotherapy combination response is very significant, especially from a patient setting. So we were delighted to see this um, in a PDX setting using such a drug and such a really simple um, uh, response for such a deadly uh, disease in itself.
Okay, so to summarize that little part, um, target and low rock, for example, and this is just an example of how simple intervital imaging can improve chemotherapy, both in the invasive context, but also can also improve how the cells respond to chemotherapy in this context. So what we're doing now, so FACID there was not FDA approved, so we've now worked with a bunch of different biotech companies, and we've actually now got two different drugs. Um, we were actually picking out these patients and trying to do a tailored response. Uh, Marina Pageant, my close collaborators, also created um, gemcitabine and geminobraxine resistant tumours. And now in a second line therapy, which is typically what you'll get um, in a clinical setting, we can actually see that the ROC actually works even better in some cases. So you've got much more fibrosis, and so therefore they're going to respond. And we're absolutely amazed to see this, that, this data, which we've not published yet, which um, Marina kindly allowed me to show today, um, where we've actually almost um, increased this by fourfold. Um, and so we've now just recently got um, money to run two clinical trials on two different arms, where we can actually use this combination therapy in the clinic using um, phase one, phase two um, based drugs where we can actually make this facetal idea possibly a real concept rather than more of a um, lab-based tool. So we're really excited about that. Okay, so to take it further then, Kendall in the group has just recently been working on facts. So we don't think this is just simply uh, a rock-based thing. We think that actually if you manipulate the extracellular matrix using many different drugs that are out there, for example, looking at the facts, Merlin axis, we can see that FAC increases as the disease goes on. We've got FAC inhibitors um, in this setting. We can do a personalized matrix again here where we can do mass spec as well, where we can see those that have got high versus low um, FAC and phospho-FAC levels. And we can actually predict which patient would um, respond to kind of metronomic targeting of FAC. And we also have correlated this with Merlin, which is involved in cell-cell contact. So those that have got less Merlin I've got more dependence on the extracellular matrix, and so therefore seem to respond to the FAC inhibitor. And so this is in final revisions now, so we're really excited to see that this concept can actually quite easily be transferred to many different aspects of uh, matrix biology, I guess, um, and then vivo setting. Okay, so another thing we do in the lab is make biosensor mice of master pathways. For example, again, just to stick to the same story, row and rack, um, for example, can be involved in the rock pathway we just talked about. So we have a raw mouse, and again, we can look in the pancreas, but we can look in many different um, organs of interest. And we've also got the rack mouse, uh, which is also kind of like the raw rack um, pathways are also interwoven in how cells move. So one of the things we really do now is use these mice as biosensors in the fully blown tumour, rather than xenografts, rather than in pancreatic orthotopic injections, to see how this affects the disease in real time in a full tumour, which may take 150 to 200 days. But I think it, that's this idea of increasing the fidelity of your model is important um, in intravital imaging. All right, so I think many people on this call don't need to know about these windows and half of the people on this call probably made these windows. So we've been working with Jakob van Rijn and we've started using these windows to actually longitudinally watch how we can target um, the extracellular matrix or various other parts of the kind of hallmarks of cancer. And the idea here is that you can actually repeatedly look in the same area over time. And this is a real advantage for the intravital imaging sphere. So here's one of my favorite movies, for example. So this is kind of neutrophils where we're, we're running into a wound. You can see the extracellular matrix being remodeled here, which is really lovely. And this is actually a raw biosensor on the right-hand side. And you can see a real remodeling of the tumor here. And I believe that this was actually um, called neutrophil swarming, which Tatiana um, told us about. I think she's also going to talk in the next session or one of the next sessions. And so I won't... Um, take her thunder here, just to say that this is actually beautiful. And one of my favorite movies, and I, the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to show you the movies that I love. And I also want to admit that half of the movies that we make, we have to throw away. And I think that's one of the problems we don't talk about in intravital imaging. And I'll show you what we've done to kind of overcome that. So before I do that, and again, Claire Renine is going to talk about this. So again, I'm only going to show one slide. We can also use these windows to repeatedly look at how Manipulating the extracellular matrix in this paper um, was on targeting perlecan, which is another matrix uh, protein where we can actually reduce the levels of 
perla can not completely reduce them but it now affects how well chemotherapy responds not just on that one day but on various days and so you can actually track this over time using these optical windows and so again just to show this in one tiny slide this is mutant cancer cells so this is the kpc cancer model with uh, educated calves and here you can see in the control setting, the cells are all yellow, and this is quantified here in black. And when you give Geminobraxin, you can see over time they start to switch, and you can see, now we can see a response, for example, to chemotherapy. When we knock out Perlican, we knock out the extracellular matrix, um, or sorry, just Perlican, not the extracellular matrix, and we can actually significantly improve chemotherapy. So we can start to use these kind of techniques to actually see how little we can touch the extracellular matrix to improve chemotherapy while maintaining normal behaviour um, and normal functions of, for example, fibroblasts in the pancreas. So I'll move on and show just two last little slides. We can also look at nuclear acting and chemotherapy and look at DNA damage using these windows. I think this is osteosarcoma set up. And this is a recent paper that, I apologise, this is not come up very well, but this is looking at AKT, um, actually in the brown fat, which you can actually find at the back of a mouse, just between the shoulder and the neck region, or you can look at visceral fat and you can actually look at the different metabol metabolic kinetics, depending on where you are. And this is a really interesting paper where we're actually looked at um, the metabolism. This is within the fat. So you can use these windows to look at so many biologies, whether it's cancer or whether it's for other diseases. And so there is a real advantage to them based on timing and how well things respond, for example, and you can see the response kinetics here. So that's all the wonderful news about windows, but the truth is they're very, very hard to work with. Um, and there's a real bottleneck here. So I'll just end by showing what we've done to actually overcome this. So as I've shown you, we've got lots of different capacities to look at the spatial distribution, the longitudinal components of imaging, various aspects of the microenvironment, um, but, and here I've shown a picture of an intestine, but what I would like to say is that if we're looking at raw, um, a lot of those mice um, had to, or those images that we created with that raw mouse, we had to throw out because they all, we were using flim to assess that threat. Now with flim, you actually have to acquire enough photons so this, the animal or the organ of interest has to be stable for us to actually get a robust readout. And so this means that we have to throw away lots of kind of images that have all gone out of focus and we actually can't have a proper resolution as to whether it's activated or not activated. So this is a case for the Ecotian as well. It's also a case even when we cross the row and rack mouse, we can actually get subcellular um, resolution between row and rack within the same cell. Um, again, Claire's work I've just discussed and James's work where this is an AKT biosensor in an individual cell been switched on and off. And here's PLIM based imaging again inside the mouse where you can see an individual particle where we can actually say red is hypoxia or normoxia and we can actually look at how this affects AKT. So you can imagine how hard that would be if you don't have stability and that is a real bottleneck in this disease. So I'll give you an example of what Sean did. So Sean used to look in the intestine and this is typically what he would see. He would acquire images but I actually have to throw everything out. And so I won't waste time, but this is one of my favorite movies. Um, so purple is the beginning of the frame. Uh, green is where we're at, we are. When I play this movie, you'll actually see this moving. You can see before and after correction. And then you can actually see down here, this is accumulated um, photons. So you're actually getting a flim image that you can see just here right now. And then we have to accumulate those. And we have to wait until there's enough, until we can get a rip. A, re a decent signal to say that we've now got flim threat. And you can see down here when I play this movie, how this goes out of focus and now how we've actually managed to stabilize this and make our lives much, much easier in the flim threat world for intravital imaging. So you can see this is peristalsis. Now we think of peristalsis as not much movement, but this is massive amounts of movement. And you can see we've already at 20 odd seconds, we've already lost our movie. And so therefore this can be very, very frustrating. And then with this new technology called Gillian, um, which is freely available and I'll give details in a minute, um, we can give this out to anyone or you can actually just download it. Um, and it has completely changed their lives in terms of the ability to image and 
even organs such as peris um, peristalsis, where you've actually got such subtle movements, but they can completely ruin experiments. So again, you can go from rubbish to publish, that's our dream. Um, and so we'll try and move on and see if we can do this. So what Sean did is actually he used this to look at how cells actually extravasate in the liver. And we can now look at SARC activity as the cells extravasate in the liver, which is close to the respiration system. And so you've got lots of movement there. And again, we've actually started using this in the lung. I think Eric showed some pictures there. So it's very useful in basically every organ because basically every organ moves. So I'm just going to end on these three last slides. Sean then did this and used Claire's project to, as an example where we gave Facidil and we looked at SARC and you can see that SARC was not activated um, correctly and then the right time to actually allow for full extravasation, which is why Facidil possibly is reducing that metastasis. But this was just a proof of principle that we could do this. Um, we can also use this um, in humans, either through the arm or for example, flim is actually using the colon actually. Um, or for NADH imaging. And Sean had actually made this handheld multi-photon with um, Chris Dunsby over in the UK. Um, and so they actually got together and combined both those technologies and said, if you've got axial correction on the skin, you can see some correction, but if you combine both that plus lateral correction, you can actually get beautiful actual images in the live arm. And you wouldn't think in the arm that you have so much movement on a multi-photon, but you actually do. So if you're doing Z stacks, you've got lots of movement to actually put those Z stacks together. And this now starts to relieve that issue. So I will end here by saying that um, intravital imaging is a fantastic technology. It has its limits, but I think that now that we've actually started to create some tools for this um, community, we can actually open up intravital imaging for many other people and clinical aspects. And again, this is free to download from this eLife paper here. It's called Galene, and Sean named that, um, which is stands for Goddess of the Calm Seas, which has definitely affected our group and how easy we can now do flim threat within our lab. I would like to just do this little plug here. Now, this is a paper that should be coming out, but we've all been talking about imaging in this setup where we've got anesthesia um, and you've got the mouse's um, really immobilized. We have problems here with the hemodynamics, for example, and this, for example, Jackie's talking about blood flow, etc. The new kind of thing is to actually do awake mice. Now, obviously, there's limitations for this in the brain, but again, you can watch the behavior, the feeding, and various other aspects of how a mouse behaves here, and you can actually probably have more of a physiological setting. So you can imagine that stabilization tools will definitely needed will be needed for this kind of awake animal imaging, which I think is the future for intravital imaging, if we can actually manage to get this onto the organs, which I still have not figured out how to do. So I'll end there. Um, and just like everybody here in Australia, everybody in the UK and the Beetson Institute, um, and all the funding bodies that I've been very lucky to have received funding from, from here in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh Actually, you, you touched on the two points that I wanted to, to raise for the general discussion. Okay. Um, so, Antonio, the, maybe before that, actually, I would like to come back because it was nice over talk. But before that, I would like to ask you one specific question on, on your talk, Paul, if possible. So you, you are showing that the, the FUSA deal would, by inhibiting ROC, you will have this uh, uh, better drug response. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you know, is it uh, the, 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 you're targeting the rock only in cancer cells or, or you think it's going mostly predominantly through cuff? And what is the, I mean, do you, by inhibiting contractility, do you also see the less deposition of extracellular matrix, for example, fibronectin in these cases, or it's only through you know, cross-linking and, and stiffening of the ECM? Yeah, so I mean, I guess it's, it's almost, it, it's basically impossible when you look at the organotypics, that was just our way of discovering that. So we actually just found that, but no way can you actually target one without target another in the in vivo setting. I just think it shows us that we didn't need to actually give that chronic treatment. Um, mm -hmm. The fast almost definitely affects the cancer cells. It definitely affects the blood vessels. And in fact, it, it obviously affects the ability of the cells to cell cycle as well. So there's an added benefit there that's in the paper, but I didn't touch on, which is all about that idea of like being involved in the furrow and about mitotic catastrophe as well. So there's other aspects, but 
without having done those kind of almost like decoupling of a pie and saying which part does this, which part does that, then we actually, if we don't deconstruct which aspect gives which benefit, then we actually don't know how to fine tune it. So that's kind of how we mm -hmm. look at that rather than a black and white. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It sounds like I have also a question. When, when you affect extracellular matrix, uh, you probably give access to immune cells. Did you see any differences in immune cell infiltration when we did these experiments in people? Yeah, so those experiments um, were about three years ago. So we did not have, um, so that was all immunocompromised. We now have made um, um, Syngenate KPC model. Um, so we've got Syngenate KPC cells and we've just about to finish with our Syngenate calf. So we've now got the system to do that. And that's exactly what we're looking at. And so we're mm -hmm. looking at things like Wnt, signal, Wnt signature and we actually see changes in the immune um, system. And again, we're working with Tatiana, et cetera, who will talk in the next session. So yeah, it would be silly not to look at that, but we didn't have the tools then, uh, we do now. And so yeah, perfect question. There is a question from the from Anonymous. Uh, uh, question is, can you use Windows to image pancreas because pancreas is deep inside, hard to image? Yeah, so those those images, yeah, def everything we do, we go into the pancreas. So our main place to go now is we always go to the pancreas, deep inside. Um, and those are abdominal windows. Again, um, many people have used those. You can readily use them on the colon you can we've used a little bit on the spleen but not much um and the liver and now we've already um kind of i was quite excited when i saw eric's pictures there of the lung the lung is that kind of place where no one would dare go um especially with a window but we've now obviously we know people have gone there and we've now got the capacity that we can actually use galene to actually stabilize the image enough to actually look at CDK biosensor imaging in response to chemotherapy in the lung. And we can see extravasation events in the lung from a tail vein so far. Um, and so that's kind of to me the holy grail of um, movement if we can start there. And there's always limits and there's always frames that you can lose. But if we can actually see those subtle changes in organs like that, then that's really exciting. But I never thought I would ever be looking at brown fat or uh, visceral fat, but when you talk to different people in different fields, they always have a new idea of how to use a window. Maybe Antonio, I can ask a question for the yeah. Jackie and Eric. Uh, so you know, the, so Paul is using uh, Galen, which is a great tool. Uh, what you guys are using for stabilization of images, or don't, you don't use anything for the image correction? Well, in our case, zebrafish embryo is quite stable, so that helps a lot if it's nicely anesthetized. And for the <laughs> mouse imaging that we've done, the mouse here was relatively stable. Uh, the mouse brain imaging has been done by uh, the group of Frank Winkler, and I mm -hmm. think that it's quite stable uh, the, the way the, the, the window is, is built. So we're, it's not something we have uh, major issues with, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, just a couple of comments. I mean, one thing that I think is quite a, a skill with this is actually all the soft, you know, surgical and tissue prep skills such that you get, um, you know, everything in as good a condition and kind of context as you can. And that actually helps a lot with the you know, stability of the images in some cases. Um, I guess regarding the specifics of uh, what we can try to do, uh, in work with Paul French's group, uh, you know, we were using a, a confocal endoscope to do FLIM and we did something relatively similar to what uh, the Galen method that Paul presented, not as quite as sophisticated as, as his, but again, it was this sort of thing that if you can register, then you can effectively um, uh, integrate the pixel information over time such that you get enough to fit the fluorescence decay curve. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I would give Paul's uh, a Galen tool a, a plug because I think it's, uh, you know, a very nice tool and more sophisticated than what we were doing. But it, we were applying the same ideas in principle. Paul, you touched a very important point. You said most of the movies you actually throw out, 
So can you give us a little bit of percentage-wise, because people should you know, be aware of the percentage of movies that you actually use, because you always print the best, right? <laughs> yeah, you do. I mean, we all do, right? But I mean, look, I think that when I started doing this with Kurt Anderson at the Beatson, um, I was delighted when I could get four or five images of a cell per day. Um, and now it's just exponentially uh, different. But that was because we didn't know what we we're doing. And again, Eric's touched upon it. It's like the black magic or those soft skills of just being in the lab, knowing when, where, and how best to do those surgeries makes everything that little bit better. Um, I, the reason I was interested in flim and uh, threat in the first place was I wanted large numbers to be absolutely robust and get quick um, responses of drugs plus and minus so just physically increasing those numbers and being reliant um, on you know there's lots of drugs people would use to stop peristalsis and then you suddenly think so suddenly look and realize that those drugs are affecting the key molecular pathway you're interested in so we just have to be cautious and you know it's getting better and better about that percentage you know it just increases every day, so I think we it's a never never changing thing. I have a question for Eric. So it's cut, coming from Catherine Monod, Stefan Germain, and a few other people. Uh, uh, so it's a mix. So the the people are, are asking how what the, what is the dynamic switch between the cell cell interactions and the cell matrix interactions in the in the story that you show us in the the cells on the edges of the tumors going into the high uh, glucose demand state. Yeah, so we haven't really um, looked at the kind of relative interplay between cell cell and cell matrix. What I can say is that when we provide the cells with kind of you know, more space, then the time frame of going from that low to that higher state is kind of six to 10 hours, that sort of time frame. Um, and the sort of reverse thing when they, you know, kind of when the kind of two sides of the wound meet and they kind of become confluent again. Again, it's a, a roughly sort of similar time period uh, and they transition back to that, that lower state. Um, I mean, just perhaps a couple of things to clarify. I mean, I noticed in the chat, there were some questions that, you know, you know I was uh, crudely equating the edge of the tumor to having more free space. And that's not really true. I mean, it's full of stuff as well. Um, what we were able to see was that if you look at the kind of the density or the nuclear density of the cells, they were less dense at the edge. So I think that probably is a fair comparison, but I don't want to sort of overstate that they're kind of free moving off into space because, you know, there's all that, um, you know, Stroman matrix that Paul was talking about that surrounds the tumors as well. And, and I, I, I also wonder, like, the, the basis of the PET imaging would be the high glucose uptake by the, from the tumor and compared to the normal stroma. But now I was very surprised to see that only on the edges of the tumor are actually high glucose state. So this is what we see on the PET images only, I mean, they would all contribute to the signal or, or you think so, that there is more cycling of the cells? No, so I, I think, you know, when people look with other methodologies, there is... Um, you know, there is some regional heterogeneity, but um, you know, it's not that the cells with the low int intracellular glucose signal are not taking up glucose. It's just that, you know, they're in a slightly different state from those that are. Mm. If we measure the relative rates, we can see a difference. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, they are glucose independent. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, we're probably, you know, compared to kind of clinical FDG PET imaging, sort of got slightly different sensitivity scales. And I think we're looking with a higher sensitivity so we can see regional differences that you probably wouldn't see in FDG PET. That's my, um, I guess, attempt to rationalize the issue that you were raising. Thank you. I can continue, Antonio. Uh, maybe yeah, question, yeah, for, question for Jackie. Uh, have you tested if certain IV subpopulations have specific fates or accumulation based on their self-representation of integrins or other molecules? Yeah, no. I, I, I replied to that question. So uh, no, we haven't. It's actually very tricky. It would be very nice to be able to, uh, to very, like clearly distinguish subpopulations and be able to manipulate them, right? Uh, at this stage, uh, well, there, there are ways to do it, but we haven't tested this, this type of, uh, of question yet. 
Am, am I allowed to ask a question to Jackie? Yeah, of course, yeah. of course, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, great data. I, I'm interested in you, know, you saying that a lot of the kind of uh, vesicles that you track end up, you think, in a degradation pathway. Yeah. So then that kind of makes me kind of think about, you know, is the effect of the um, kind of vesicles just the, the, you know, the myeloid cells are, are eating more, so it's a generic response to eating more stuff, or is it that actually you get cargo release into the cytoplasm of those myeloid cells? Because if they're kind of going in a degradation pathway, I'm, I don't quite see how the, well, exactly. the cell biology of it works. You were the first to be surprised that they go very directly to, to, that, uh, to, to, to that subcellular compartment. Of course, cargo might be delivered right before the, the degradation phase, so that's what one idea. Uh, we're not sure at this stage that the lysosomal degradative compartments are the ones that are also targeted in other cell types that do uptake extra vesicles. So this is another as, as aspect of, for example, and the chiral cells, they do uptake in that particular context, also quite a reasonable amounts of extra vesicles. And we're not fully sure because the, the correlative, the CLEM approach is, is a bit more tricky to, uh, to set up uh, in the context of endothelial cells. So this is, uh, this is one approach uh, where, which would allow to actually, uh, to actually unravel, unravel what is uh, happening. And one, like degradation is one aspect is that it might favor nutrient supply for the, for the cells. So this is something that might, uh, might occur, occur definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, you can ask. Uh, Eric, I think you touched upon it, and then I think it might have been at the end of your talk, but you just didn't have time. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, at the very beginning, you had the, the metabolism of those cells, then you had calves, um, and you'd switched that off, and then later on, I thought that was going to come, but I think you actually have got that at the end of your talk. I just didn't get to see that almost, how the calves are actually providing... Um, that kind of energy or the reverse Warburg effect to the um, cancer cells? Yeah, so um, good question. It's all sort of still work in progress. Um, in terms of what we have some data to support, it's actually not lactate transfer, it's potentially pyruvate transfer, um, which would be a little bit different from the kind of yeah. canonical reverse Warburg that, effect that people have proposed. Um, and then the bit I kind of whizzed through quickly, um, just for reasons of time, was uh, some recent observations that when um, cancer cells arrive in the lungs, they exchange extensive signals with the lung epithelium. So actually not fibroblastic cells, but the untransformed lung epithelium. And that seems to do things uh, to you know, their lysosomal compartment and also aspects of their lipid metabolism. Um, so that's another kind of area, and I think one that had been overlooked because generally, you know, all those tumor microenvironment cartoons, right? They've got T cells and macrophages and neutrophils and CAFs, but they don't have other epithelial cells on there. And probably that's because in the primary tumor, it just overgrows everything else. So it's not really relevant. But when cells arrive at a new organ, particularly an epithelial organ, such as the liver that you study or the lungs or whatever, then there's a moment where the ratio of non-transformed epithelial cells in the local environment to the cancer cells is very much in favor of those um, non-transformed parenchymal epithelial cells. So I think at that stage, there's this kind of crosstalk having a strong effect on the cancer cell phenotype. Um, but yeah, we would love to have like you know, multiplex sensors in all cell types you know, present, right? And then we could figure out what was going on. Yeah, perfect. Can I, can I have go for a question? Uh, so you two guys, Paul and, and Eric, you, you moved the field to a new, a new uh, aspect. So using biosensor, that's, I think it's a great tool that is being used always more now. I was wondering, uh, what is your feeling? Because you're using also non-linear non imaging uh, every now and then, uh, looking at SHJ imaging, for example. So what do you think this, uh, well, I'm, I was a bit surprised to see that this type of imaging is not uh, being used routinely now in, uh, in every single lab and you think that there's still a, a potential of being used more. I've seen like last week some nonlinear imaging in, uh, in the superficial embryo in the context of, uh, of development that was just amazing in terms of, at least in terms of temporal resolution that it can, uh, can uh, uh, resolve. So, so what do you think about that? 
Paul, you go first. Yeah. Um, I, like, okay, I mean, you know, I, I try to come across and say it does seem very difficult to do when you look at it because we just show these wonderful movies and um, it all looks very difficult. But I think what I try to do with the, that kind of those reviews on those biosensors and Eric would probably agree to this. It's like if you can transfect to HeLa cell, you can get involved in um, using firstly the threat technology, but the non-linear aspects. Most um, labs in the world now at least have some sort of multi-photon. It might not be set up for full intravital imaging, but at least you can, the simple thing like a CDM, like a cell-derived matrix does have SHG signal as long as you look at it after three days, right? Um, you can do very, very simple um, work in this area and then actually get a very simple answer to sometimes something that you've been working on for far too long. Um, I think that I think everyone should do it, but not too many people. But right? not so many people having a two photons. So this is not still yeah, a common I mean, equipment in every lab. My, my question is more towards the fact that we can potentially more use more label-free approaches, right? Which might... Uh, in some point, we're all over expressing fluorescent proteins and biosensors and so on. And uh, so uh, I was wondering what, what you guys think about using label free approaches. So, I mean, I think you know, label free approaches have the massive benefit that's inherent in their name and that you don't have to put anything into the system. The, the challenge that you know, we've found with using those is knowing at a kind of more molecular level what you're actually reading out. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, by way of sort of, you know, backstory to the, the metabolism project that I spoke about, you know, it's Kurt Anderson, who Paul knows well from the Beats and was kind of heavily involved in this. And the initial idea was to start off looking at these variations in NAD, um, you know, autofluorescence that you can clearly see and you know, they relate to some sort of cell state because there's, you know, there's variation and they go up and down with various drug treatments. Um, but we kind of got a bit stuck because, you know, that's probably more reading out the, you know, the free versus the protein bound form as opposed to specifically the redox state. And then we just sort of had questions about, well, what does that actually mean? Um, so, you know, that's why, you know, we still like the biosensors because it kind of gives us a molecular anchor to build out from. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a huge amount of stuff in Raman spectroscopy and, you know, variants of, you know, cars or whatever um, that is, again, looking label-free. Um, and, but I still think it suffers a little bit with the problem that you don't exactly know what you're looking at. And my background is, you know, kind of molecular. I'd like to you know, know about you know a gene or a kinase or whatever that I can interfere with um, and making that leap from label free to the molecular is hard yeah I think in, that, in, that, in that sense there's cars cars and SRS strategies to follow up molecules but that is interesting actually if you have specific molecules or specific bridges in their atoms then you can follow them actually I think but the, as you said, basically to see an activation of uh, an enzyme, cars is not yet there, I think. Yeah. And perhaps just a, another comment um, about, uh, Paul's talking about, you know, SHG and matrix imaging, which you know, isn't particularly difficult. But I think one of the challenges for the field is, you know, getting good quantification because you know, it's rather difficult, you know, even with, you know, the best intentions for, you know, Paul and I to quantitatively, you know, compare our data and that's completely different from if we were kind of transcriptomics guys or you know cancer genomics guys because they're you know uh standardized methods for comparison of nucleic acid sequencing have abounded over the last 15 years which i think has been fantastic for the field um but these imaging based approaches we're lagging behind which is making it hard for the kind of community momentum to to build and to cross-reference and that's something that we're interested in trying to solve i mean yeah even just today i was actually using one of um eric's tools or one of the tools you've just recently published eric's because i just wanted to compare it to what we've done and we need your tool to look at the branch points of those versus the actual cross-linking and again 
the, the, the community is there and it's they're sending all these tools out and eventually we all will have quite common tools but it is just as you say it's just a lagging and we just need to work that's why this forum is great because everyone can actually say can I use that tool can I use this tool and mm -hmm. which one is for which scenario right it's definitely one of the idea of this club is also to to uh, well raise some sort of community in terms of intravital imaging which could benefit to all of us we are all sending people to uh, other labs to get trained I think for example one idea that would I would love to raise after this type of meeting is to to get some you know something together to uh, I don't know have some sort of a workshop of training people to get surgery done for uh, abdominal window so that everyone could come and and, and be trained and uh, I think this would be uh, highly beneficial to the to the field I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is also something that I, I want, somebody was asking, I don't, uh, the question is gone, but uh, all the, uh, probably it was for Paul. All the, the plasmid biosensors that you use, are they available and to everybody? So at least for this community, right? So the people just need to write to you and you will be able to give them, right? Yeah, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing I've used that you can't, um, it's not publicly available, none of it. Um, in fact, um, that's the first point. And as Eric said, and I kind of, um, Matsuda is a real kind of hero of that area where he's actually made constructs where he says you can now make rapidly, uh, make various different biosensors there. And again, they're freely available and he's very open to that. And everyone that I've ever worked with with that field wants their biosensor to be used. Quite often, someone will make a biosensor, use it in vitro, and then never ever talk about it again. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, I've come along and said, I've made a mouse out of that. Do you, are you okay with that? And, and they've said, well, I'm never going to do it. And then they're amazed that it, A, it works. And also it may actually read out things that they never expected. And again, as I said, each of those mice, um, Heidi Welsh was the first person I worked with with the rack mouse. And she just gives that to everyone. And the row, and the row mouse and the Ekater mouse are constantly being sent out. And we even send the ones that we have not published that you see there out early because it's going to take a while to get it up and running. So the AKT, mm -hmm. the CTK, the SARC, um, they're all coming, um, but they're all freely available and people have already started taking them and using them. I would like also to ask one question. It's coming from Anuk Zomar. It's for Eric, but I would also like Paul to answer it. So for your uh, um, intravital experiments, uh, will you be able to use intravital, uh, so the imaging window to study metabolism over the course of tumor progression and response to the therapy? Yeah, so uh, then, yes, if it, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd have that data <laughs> already. But um, yeah, so we now have these things, um, you know, with the windows implemented and when we're fully back up to speed, that data should be coming through. Um, the other kind of point to make that we're embarking on that relates to, again, you know, Paul's work in the AKT sensor is multiplexing, so you can read out multiple things in the same cell at once, because um, that gives you a much better kind of triangulation of cell state than just using a single sensor. Um, but it involves a little bit of creativity uh, around colors. I think Paul showed a, a row rack double which was nice yeah i mean that was that was lucky because of those colors but again sean warren is a very clever person and very hard to do that um the akt one we use plim right because plim actually works on a completely different time scale so you don't have to have a color issue and it's a completely different process um and again we've used the akt as eric says we've used that to look at um not so much metabolism, just as the AKT or the PI3 kinase pathway as the disease progresses. And again, that is coming out through Max Nobis. And we've combined that with um, DNA damage effects and how that affects metabolism. So these things are coming out. So yeah, good to know. And th this could be done in zebrafish. Somebody, uh, Ikyot is asking, maybe in a question, do uh, zebrafish establish tumors? Jackie? <laughs> Well, there are definitely tumor models, and as I replied, uh, zebrafish yeah. derived uh, tumor models also that that we are using in this particular paper, uh, zebrafish melanoma system coming from Richard White. It works very well, uh, so it allows to have access to syngenic uh, system also. Yeah, of course the questions might be a bit different. Uh, I'm not looking at the same same type of questions definitely.
And Jackie, could you tell us how easy it is to set up this correlative imaging approach that you said? Is a regular lab able to do that? What's, what should we have? Uh, myself, I would say it's very tricky. So the correlative imaging in, in, uh, in the perfusion is, uh, is quite easily, uh, uh, easily done. And uh, what, we, what we did, and this is again, we see the work of Mathia Kareman and, uh, and Luc Mercier in my, in, my, uh, in my team, but Mathia was the one in the lab of Yannick Schwab developing the quality microscopy in the mouse system. It's a very tedious work, of course, uh, uh, and we relied on many, like, uh, on, on uh, time-consuming uh, procedures to, to be able to, to do that. But what she developed with Yannick, uh, using, for example, MicroCity, allowed to quite significantly uh, improve uh, uh, the, the speed of the, of the system. But you definitely need to have some sort of magic fingers to be able to do that. So this relates a bit back to uh, being able to do surgery to implement uh, surgical windows. You need very specific expertise to be able to do that. And, uh, and uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, a ready-to-use system, uh, uh, definitely. Uh, I think the other more specific questions for your talks, you answered them directly, so, both all yeah, of you, yeah. so on the chat. Mm -hmm. And we are already 10 minutes late, so yeah. I would have closed here. I would have thanked the, all three speakers. It was fantastic. And I, I especially thank you for um, asking each other questions, really engaging yeah. into the discussion. It was really lo Good lovely. Time. Very good interaction. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, especially a lot of people stay until the end. So that's surprising. That's good. Thank At you least much. half. <laughs> it was very nice. And see you in two weeks. Yes. Yeah, so nice. See you soon. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.